why don't you tell us about your experience with Dr. Hall and Dr. Clifton? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, I took a class from Bill Hall, and um, you know, he talked a lot about the things they were doing. And uh, as I recall, one of the first things he talked about was the fact that in the insurance industry, <clears throat> about 90% of the new uh, insurance salesmen don't last more than about a year. And uh, so the industry is very concerned about the cost of hiring and training new people repeatedly. And uh, so he told a little bit about the fact that he and Don Clifton were trying to devise a, um, some type of questionnaire that high-performing insurance salesmen answered differently than those who didn't make it. And uh, so essentially what they were doing <clears throat> was they were studying the best, the, uh, the high producers. And uh, at that time in psychology, most people were either studying abnormal psychology, uh, people who had psychoses, um, many depressive illness, uh, you know, those kinds of problems, or else they were studying rats, trying to figure out why <clears throat> rats would hit a bar so many times for a pellet of food, or what made them turn right or left in a maze, with the idea that if they could understand rats, then maybe they could move on to chimpanzees or monkeys, and then maybe someday they would be able to understand and predict what human beings would do. And uh, so that was kind of where psychology was, and nobody was really involved in studying um, uh, high-performing individuals. And uh, so um, they were really kind of ground-breaking uh, individuals at that time. So was Dr. Hall or Dr. Clifton uh, one of your dissertation advisors? Um, no, a guy named Bob Stake. He was a statistician. <clears throat> and he was more involved with uh, why rats turn which way in a maze. <laughs> and, um, and then for the uh, doctor's degree, it was Warren Baller, was the uh, chairman of the department. Now, Hall and Clifton were uh, in some ways seen as a little bit different by, because of their orientation. They were not considered to be hardcore researchers. Yeah, they were not... Um, within the mainstream of psychology at that point. But they, uh, they obviously did some great things, and I knew what they were, the kinds of things that they were doing with their project. And then <clears throat> later on, um, when uh, uh, Don Clifton uh, founded what is now Gallup, uh, was at that time SRI, Selection Research, and uh, of course, what they were doing, they were specializing in trying to uh, differentiate high performers from those who wouldn't do as well. And so various companies <clears throat> were buying their uh, questionnaires and their surveys, and, and uh, they were trying to do lots of interviews with high-performing people to find out what made them unique. So uh, they asked me to join um, SRI <clears throat> in an advisory board capacity. And so I remember the meeting we had one time when they were debating back and forth whether to purchase the name Gallup. Gallup at that time was strictly a polling company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the price tag was $10 million for that name. The Gallup brothers were deciding that they were going to try to sell the name. And, and um, so uh, <clears throat> people went back and forth. And finally, the decision was made to go ahead and buy the, the name Gallup. And... Uh, of course, that turned out to be a very good investment, but it, at the time that it was done, uh, SRI was kind of on the brink financially, and I think it was a pretty big hurdle for them. So it was a much bigger decision than what many people would think that it might have been at that time. And of course, now they've moved on into other areas where they're doing a lot of political polling and those kinds of things, as well as some of the selection uh, research that they did a long time ago. So. Anyway, uh, and Don Clifton lived across the park from me, so we got to be reasonably good friends, and we, I think we admired each other. Uh, at least I admired him. I don't know if he admired me. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so anyway, we, that was kind of where our relationship began. Well, how have their ideas impacted your work as a coach, mm -hmm. as a dad, as athletic director, as a congressman? Well, 
many people have read the uh, book by um, Don Clifton and Tom Rath called "How How Full Is Your uh, How Full Is Your Bucket?" and um, in that book, uh, Don pretty much traces the idea of positive psychology. The uh, the fact that so many prisoners of war from in the Korean War died, I think it was about 38 percent, died. And they were not beaten, they were not tortured, they were not malnourished. Uh, but they were <clears throat> divided uh, away from leaders. They were encouraged to inform on each other. They got any kind of bad news that came from home, no good news, nothing supportive. And, and he said, you know, if negative news and negative environment could create that kind of chaos, then maybe the opposite would be true, that uh, positive reinforcement, uh, a kind word, uh, might have a, uh, a symbiotic effect on, on people. And so uh, that was sort of, I guess, the genesis of the idea of positive psychology. And, um, and I guess as far as coaching is concerned, <clears throat> I came to believe that the best way to change behavior was to, uh, if you could, catch somebody doing something right and reinforce it. Uh, sometimes people see coaching as continually criticizing and fault finding and, and chewing people out, but that gets pretty old and um, <clears throat> it really doesn't do a whole lot to promote uh, better behavior. And um, so we, we uh, I remember Lou Holtz coming up to visit us. He was coaching our, at Arkansas at the time. It was during the season. He had an open date and I'd never had a coach ever ask me to come up and watch our practices and sit in our meetings during the season. Uh, he was the only one that ever did. <clears throat> and so he was there for about two days. And before he left, he said, uh, the one thing that really jumped out at me about this place was how positive your coaches were. He said he, I'd, he'd never seen anything like that before. I said, well, I, I'm glad you saw that because I guess that's the way I would want it to be. And so it didn't mean that there was never an unkind word, you know, in, in coaching. But for the most part, we did try to be positive. And if we caught somebody doing something wrong, we wanted to make sure that they understood how to do it right. Mm -hmm. So often people just criticize and they really never tell, explain very clearly what it is they want. And, um, and you know, there's, there are ways to correct uh, improper behavior in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what we tried to do. And I think that made a difference. And, and in the athletic department, I try to create a culture or an environment that's fairly positive. I think the research from the um, uh, Department of Labor indicates that about um, that most people who leave their jobs <clears throat> do so not because of benefits or pay, but because they uh, don't feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, something like 65% of people report that they've not received a compliment or a kind word about their work in the past year. And so probably one of the, the uh, most cost effective and most effective things that a person can do with uh, employees or others that they're around is to, is to um, point out the good things and to recognize the things that are positive that people do. Well, as you know, Dr. Hall and Dr. Clifton established Nebraska Human Resources mm -hmm. Research Foundation right. right about 1949, and they built the foundation on the idea of the investment relationship to mm -hmm. help people recognize their talents and invest in those talents. And I think one of your most famous examples of the investment relationship is through your coaching. So how, mm -hmm. how did you take this idea of the investment relationship and, and how did you create those kinds of relationships mm -hmm. with your players? Well, um, I've already mentioned uh, how you would correct a player. You know, if a player tackles with his head down, you could say, you know, Jones, you idiot, you tackled with your head down again, and you could you could be hurt badly, and I hope you are. Uh, uh, you deserve it. Or you could say, you know, Jones, uh, uh, we've seen it seen you do it right a thousand times. Keep your head up, lock your arms, drive your feet, and uh, we know you can do that. And that's the way to tackle. And uh, so there's a difference in in how you correct people. So we think that's that was important. I I thought that building uh, relationships with players was important. And uh, so every day we would lift weights after practice and uh, I'd go in there and I'd mess around in the weight room. I obviously you can see from looking at me, it didn't take very well, <laughs> but um, uh, I'd be down there for 20, 30 minutes and 
in the course of that time, I would usually talk to maybe five or six players for three, four, five minutes, and usually it would be about their grades or about their high school team or their family, and uh, it would be um, uh, pretty much strictly on their turf, on their terms. And uh, so uh, one thing that they reported later uh, in a book that was written <clears throat> was that we knew their names, and we not only knew their names, but we knew the names usually of their parents and quite often their brothers and sisters and and that we uh, treated the players on the first team uh, just as we would the players on the fourth team and that uh, they were convinced as players that they were important to us as people you know the first team player was going to be more important to you on Saturday afternoon because he was going to play but they felt that uh, the uh, well-being the academic progress the health of all the players was equally important to us. And uh, so I, I think that was something that helped build the culture. And, and I think that uh, we usually had pretty good team chemistry and I think that was part of it. Well, I have to tell you, when I teach the NHRA class to our incoming mm -hmm. sophomores every year, we talk about referent power, power mm -hmm. by virtue of respect. And I always mm -hmm. use you as the perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And that many of your former players talk about how they'd run through a wall for you if you ask them. And I think a lot about your walk-on program. Mm -hmm. You know, here are these guys who had decent talent, but they mm -hmm. weren't being recruited for scholarship positions. And you were able to find that talent and develop mm -hmm. it to where they were producing at a maximum level. Did you have mm -hmm. a philosophy behind that? Well, <clears throat> well, you know, football is um, pretty much of a developmental sport. It may not be quite like basketball or golf where sometimes by the time a person's a senior in high school their skills are pretty fully developed and uh, so we uh, we have people in the state with fairly big frames and so we might find a guy that was 6'5 and 215 and and uh, fairly big bones and with a good weight program and some encouragement uh, wouldn't be right away, but within three years, you know, that guy might be 280 pounds and improve his speed and his strength. And so the developmental aspects of football uh, uh, helped us as far as the walk-ons were concerned. But also, I think a very important part of it was the fact that we, we tried to structure practice and we tried to build the program in such a way that uh, they all felt uh, that they were treated equally. Most, most of the walk-ons could not really tell you <clears throat> who the scholarship players were or who the walk-ons were. And most scholarship players couldn't tell you whether most players were walk-ons or scholarship. They were, they were treated exactly the same. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think that made a difference. And, and whether you played or not on Saturday, didn't really make any difference whether you're a scholarship player. I mean, if you if you were able to grade better than somebody else at your position, you moved ahead of them. And uh, and we tried to save a number of scholarships every year for walk-ons. We the standard deal was that if a player became either first or second at his position at the end of spring ball, then we would reward them with a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they always knew that that, <clears throat> that carrot, that opportunity was out there. And uh, so as we looked at it over the years, uh, you know, our travel squad was usually about 60 players. And I think I averaged it out one time over a five or six year period that we probably traveled about 24 walk-ons, guys who came as walk-ons, about 24 out of the 60 on average were players who came as walk-ons. <clears throat> so when you figure that about 40% of your players who were really contributing and playing an important role on Saturday afternoon came as walk-ons. It was a tremendous boost to, to our team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of those, you'd usually have five, six, seven, maybe sometimes as many as eight or nine who were actually starting among the top 22, 24 players. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else with regard to your experience with Dr. Hall or Dr. Clifton or this idea of positive psychology that has had an impact on your work that we haven't mm -hmm. discussed already? Well, not much other than the fact that um, they took something that was theoretical and uh, and particularly in Don Clifton's case, they moved far beyond that. And 
went out in the business world and began to apply some of the, the things that they thought uh, made sense and began to substantiate it with research. And of course, uh, everyone can see what, what has happened with Gallup and the old SRI principles. <clears throat> and you got guys like Marcus Buckingham and others who have gone on to become very prominent in the field, Jim Clifton you know, and, and uh, Jane Miller and others. And, and so um, they've certainly gone beyond the halls of academia. And uh, so often that's kind of where it ends. Somebody uh, has, a, has a theory or writes a book, but they never really apply it. These guys did. And they, uh, they proved that there was something there. And uh, it's now widely accepted and yet back in those days of the early 1960s, uh, there were a lot of people who were in the, the discipline of psychology who would have no part of it. And uh, so time has really uh, proven that they were, they were on the right track. Mm -hmm. Tom, I, I do want to tell you that mm -hmm. when I talk to these kids about building investment relationships and you know, mm -hmm. they're all working one-on-one -on -one with a K-12 student, mm -hmm. I often reference your relationship with your players and mm -hmm. your former That's players. Good. Is Talk about yeah. the difference you made with you that. Just, so for what that's worth. <clears throat> just as long as you pick the right players, it'll work. <laughs>